Good morning, everybody. I am so happy you could join us this morning. These sessions are among my favorite things to do in AUW. It's just amazing every year that we get so many talented young women who have been awarded fellowships or grants to uh, continue their studies, to start their uh, postdoctoral or whatever. It's just amazing. It is amazing. So I want to thank you all for joining us. And I also want to thank you all for the years of fundraising that you have done to establish these endowments, which fund all of these studies. I mean, it is just amazing. You do book sales, you do hikes, you do runs, uh, you have uh, authors come. And because it's California, you might have even done a little wine tasting, but we won't tell anybody. But anyway, we raise a lot of money each year for AUW Fund, and I want to thank you and congratulate you for all the work you've done. I bet you don't know that we have 154 research and project endowments. We have 23 international fellowship endowments, and we have 68 American fellowship endowments, and that's just in California. So those are kind of little known facts that I wanted to tell you. Last year, we were able to raise, even in COVID, we were able to raise over $518,000 to donate to AUW Fund. And you're going to meet Lynn Batchelor in just a few minutes, but she is our AUW Fund Chair this year, and she's also our Board Secretary. And she has set an even loftier goal of $555,000. So we're coming out of COVID, so we'll see if we can meet that. I bet we can. I bet we can even pass $555,000. So you have just done amazing work and you're going to be amazed by these young women. It's gonna make you feel so proud to be an AUW member. I mean, just think of all the good work that they're gonna be doing for the world. Now, before we go on to introduce our guests from National, I would like to uh, let you know that we have a few members in the audience that you won't be able to see them, but they're watching us. So from our national board, we have Sherry Sorokin, who is a member of the Marin branch, and she's joining us this morning. And we also have a past national president that you're gonna meet in a short time, actually at the end of this session, Sharon Schuster is with us this morning. We have past state leaders, we have past, past state presidents. Uh, we have Donna Lilly, Joanne Brown, Gloria Taylor, Jane Niemeyer, and Kathleen Doty. So thank you all for being so engaged and coming back to visit with us. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our national guest this morning, who lives on the East Coast. So she didn't have to get up quite as early as we all did, but she probably did because she has two young children. But I'd like to introduce Katrina Sun Breeze. She's been with AUW for about six months now, and she's the Senior Director of Institutional Advancement. And uh, she is responsible for developing and implementing strategy for and managing aspects of AUW's philanthropic and dues revenue generating programs. So that's a long way of saying that she's going to be working with us on membership and fundraising. And she's the head of the advancement committee at AUW, where I've met her just recently. So she's had 15 years of experience in nonprofit fundraising, specializing in education and healthcare. Prior to joining AUW, she was the Vice President of Development and External Affairs at APIA Scholars, the nation's largest organization dedicated to supporting Asian and Pacific Islander Americans. In addition to her work at API Scholars, she has held leadership roles in development at PDK International, the Innova Health Foundation, and the George Washington University Medical Center. 
She's an avid traveler. She's lived all over the world and, and in lots of states in, in the United States, but she has lived in South Korea, Pakistan, Bolivia, Texas, Mississippi, California, Connecticut, DC, and Virginia. So that's almost everywhere. She and her husband, Adam, live in Northern Virginia, and she's a proud parents of two children. And I've seen one of them kind of in a cameo appearance one day. Very, very cute. So welcome, Katrina. Thank you so much, Diane, for that really kind introduction. And I don't have any kiddos in the house today. They're at a little league game, which I'll be heading to right after today's event. Uh, thank you uh, once again, Diane, and to all of our AAUW California members joining us this morning. I'm so honored to join you during this event today, celebrating our inspiring AAUW fellowship and grant recipients. I had the opportunity to meet some of them very briefly ahead of today's event and got a sneak peek of what they'll be presenting. They are truly impressive, powerful women, and we should all be so proud to support and uplift them today. As Diane mentioned, I'm AUW National Senior Director of Institutional Advancement. And in that capacity, I lead our fundraising and membership teams here at the AUW National Office. I joined just about six months ago. And since my first day, I've been learning so much about the impactful work that our branches and affiliates across the country are doing, including of course, AUW California. I must admit that California always holds a soft, spot, a soft spot in my heart as I was born in Sonoma County, but I have also been so impressed by the dedication, passion, and philanthropy of AAUW California members. Some of you may know that 2021 marks the 140th anniversary of AAUW, and we are so proud of its rich history. In the coming weeks, the national office will be sharing with you some ways we are celebrating, including a 140th anniversary commemorative webpage and video, a series of educational webinars. And finally, on November 17th at 4 p.m. Eastern time, we will be holding a 140th anniversary virtual celebration where we will also be unveiling and recognizing this year's Distinguished Alumni Recognition Award recipient. It's still a secret. I'm, I myself don't know, but am told that this recipient is um, very well known, has a national and international reputation, and we're really looking forward to announcing this little secret. Please do save the date once again, and it is November 17th at 4 p.m., the formal invitation and Zoom registration link will be in your email inboxes very soon. I mentioned earlier that I'm still new to AUW, and so when I have the time, I try to learn more about our history. Um, 140 years is, is quite a lot of history to get up to speed on. Um, and many of you may already know about this story, um, but in 1888, AUW's founder, Marion Talbot, made the call to create a fund to support graduate women. And as a result, the very first fellowship was awarded to Ida Street in the amount of $350. Both Marion and AAUW's fellowships chairman, Christine Ladd Franklin, asked all AAUW's members to contribute $1, which at the time was, was actually quite significant. Um, the significance of this story, which is from over 100 years ago, still resonates with me today, and that philanthropy is one of the most powerful ways we can support women who are making history today and well into the future. This year, we ask each of you to consider making a contribution in honor of our 140th anniversary through our end of year giving campaign. A gift to the AUW Fund or our greatest needs fund is an investment in our future for the next 140 years. Our traditions and history should always be honored and celebrated, but the world is also changing very quickly and we must be equipped to respond and develop new and innovative ways to accomplish our mission. AAUW is standing on solid ground because of your continued generosity and we are very excited to announce that this year's end of year giving campaign offers donors a historic matching gift opportunity. 
Our national board, committee leaders, and staff, including myself and our new CEO, Gloria Blackwell, have contributed to a matching gift pool of over $69,000, which is actually a record high for us. So I'm really proud to make that announcement. You'll be able to see the names of all of our matching gift supporters on the 140th anniversary website, which will launch in early November. We hope you will join us during this anniversary year to support greatest needs and AUW fund in honor of our 140th year and in support of our next 140 years. Thank you all once again for your support and congratulations to the fellows and grantees we will be hearing from today. Thank you so much, Katina. Thank you very much. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. And everyone, We'll be, we'll be learning more about the 140th anniversary for sure, but thank you for giving us all those details. Okay, and so now we're going to begin listening to our fellows, fellows and grantees. And uh, what we're going to do, each one of the women that are going to speak this morning have five to seven minutes to speak because we have 13 today and the time will go very fast. But we want to be sure that uh, you know them and get to know them in this short, short time that they'll have. And so I'll be introducing the first group and then uh, Lynn Batchelor will introduce the second group. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Reem Al Olabi. She has a PhD and she has a research publication grant in engineering, medicine and science. She is uh, a, an assistant professor at California North State University, and that's where she's going to be doing her research at that university. Her discipline is biology, and she's going to be telling us all about some interesting things with proteins and associated tremor and all kinds of different things that she's going to be doing to help us live a better life. So take it away, Reem. Thank you so much for this beautiful introduction and thank you so much for being here and it's an honor to be in this uh, great virtual event. Hopefully one day we can meet in person. Um, and uh, can we go to the next slide please? Yes. So the next one. So this is basically a journey into drug discovery. Um, and can we go to the next slide? Thank you. So how about I start with a little bit of a story? Uh, and it's simply a story of a nine-year-old girl who on her ninth birthday, she was asked, what would you like? She loved Barbies, by the way. She loved all sorts of toys and games and everything. Nonetheless, on the ninth birthday, she asked for a microscope and she asked to have a small lab in her room. And this young girl grew up to be a pharmacist. And then she was blessed to have a master's and PhD in biotechnology, where her uh, fascination about drug discovery and, uh, um, you know, especially against infectious disease started. So during her master's and PhD, what she did is she tried to identify drugs against malaria, hepatitis C. And then she felt, you know what, I think a master's of public health would make me see the picture in a better, foot, more full way, right? So seeing the picture uh, as it should be seen, uh, because at the end, everything that we do in the scientific research community should aim at improving the health of the public, right? And then she went on and she became a postdoctoral researcher in a couple of countries, ending in UC Davis Mind Institute, where her fascination about neurological disorders and the genetics, epigenetics, and the different aspects of neurological disorders made her feel, you know what? I do have some background in drug discovery. Why shouldn't I merge between the drug discovery background in addition to, neuro to neurological disorders? She was blessed when she was, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I just came out of COVID by the way, so <laughs> COVID father, so yes, I am free, COVID free now. So anyways, back to the story. So she, um, at the end of her postdoctoral phase, she was actually granted an AAUW for the uh, American uh, postdoctoral, uh, I think it's called the American Postdoctoral Fellowship. Uh, nonetheless, it was her, um, 
it was time for her to step to the next phase, which is to be an assistant professor. So unfortunately, she had to decline it, but she was persistent to apply again as a junior scientist. <clears throat> and here am I today <clears throat> uh, with you because um, I was blessed to get the AAUW uh, publication, a research and publication uh, grant. And actually, that was a little bit of my story. <laughs> so uh, how about we talk a little bit about Two projects that I'm working on next piece. It's, it's, it's going to be a quick brief. So the first project that I'm working on is actually called elucidating the role of heat shock proteins in fax tests. Fax tests or fragile X tremor and ataxia associated syndrome is a neurodegenerative disorder like Parkinson's, like Alzheimer's. Nonetheless, it's considered an orphan disease. So not a lot of attention goes towards that disease um, that is why I felt, you know what, I would love to work more on an orphan disease because there are patients, right, that are suffering from this disease and they have altered quality of life. So how about maybe I contribute to that field and maybe I can try to meet the need of pharmacological interventions. And in regards to it, it simply aims at finding drug targets uh, that would help in uh, ameliorating the clinical phenotypes in patients with FACSAS. So that's the first project. The second one, of course, we all know that we are living in the COVID era, right? And now it became the pre and the post COVID era. I hope someday we say post, it's not post yet. Nonetheless, I felt, you know what, I think I should also try to contribute to that field. Who knows, maybe uh, one day I'll be able to identify a drug that can treat COVID-19. We have the vaccine, not only one vaccine, but many vaccines, which is amazing. Nonetheless, until this day, there's no FDA approved drug that can treat COVID. That is why, and I cannot say I, we, because research is always about group work. So we are trying to target the entry phase of COVID-19 to block the virus early on from entering the cell and occupying our body, right? So the aim of this project is to identify small molecule inhibitors that block the entry of hep um, not hepatitis C, COVID-19 in this case, into our cells. So these are the two projects. Yes, we do, and uh, it's really important to obtain results. Nonetheless, next please. It's also very important to involve students. And I'm really blessed to be teaching undergraduate and post back students who most of them actually uh, are pre-med students or pre-pharmacy or pre-dentistry. Nonetheless, I feel that equipping them with scientific thinking and research skills and, and having them think about bridging the gap between the science community and the patients and the public and how them as future physicians being involved in research will definitely make them well-rounded physicians. This by itself is a win-win situation for me. And that is why I'm truly, truly blessed and honored to have been one of the recipients of the research grant award, because it's not only helping me do the research that I've always wanted to do as a PI, but it's also helping me inspire students, my students and involving them in that research. Thank you so much for listening. Well, thank you very yeah, much, right. and I'm so glad that you're back. Thank you. I'm glad you're feeling well. Yes, thank you. Thank you. That was a great, great story. Thank you. Okay, and next I'm going to be introducing Jody Diamond, and she's with the Boys and Girls Club of Oceanside, and she has received what we call a community action grant. And it's a one-year grant, and she is going to be working. Her project name is Streaming Ahead. And I've met Jody, and she is so enthusiastic about this grant. So, and the work that she's doing. So take it away, Jody. I'm stuck. Are you okay, Jody? Jody, I just ask you to start your video if that works. I think we can hear you. If that doesn't work, we can proceed without your video. 
or did we just perhaps lose Jody? There she is. She's coming back. Okay, I'm so sorry. It um, it definitely uh, it it gave a little bit of a a, a start. So, my apologies. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. I'm so sorry. Technical That's difficulties. Okay. The age of Zoom. So thank you so much for uh, waiting for me and pausing. I am Jody Diamond. I'm the CEO of Boys and Girls Club of Oceanside and uh, super thankful and blessed to have received this grant uh, for Streaming Ahead program for girls. Next slide, please. So I, uh, you'll see on screen our mission. You can read it. The way I like to say is, you know, at Boys and Girls Clubs of Oceanside, we provide a kaleidoscope of opportunities for youth to find their passion, whatever that might be. What they can get at home, we leave at home. For us, it's really about creating a space to expand their horizons. Um, a little bit about where I work. Oceanside, California, we have 13 documented gangs, the highest number of gangs outside of San Diego proper. So the reality is, is that if we don't do our job well, our kids are gonna die on the street. We've had numerous murders of youth over the last seven years. Our building actually sits between two rival gangs. So what the magic that happens within our facility uh, is being able to show them what the big world holds because how do you know what you wanna do if you've never been exposed to it? Uh, next slide, you can actually skip the next slide and go on to the, the fourth slide. In 19, uh, the Boys and Girls Club of America did a national survey and they found that 90% of club alumni graduate. My board is a very bold and engaged board. And they said, wow, that's great. But in Oceanside, we want 100% to graduate. So it's not just about graduating, it's about getting over the finish line with a plan for the future. So our goal is not to have 90% because how do you tell a parent I'm sorry, your child's in that 10%, they're not gonna graduate. It's not acceptable for us. We want all 100% to graduate with a plan for the future. Next slide, please. Just a little bit of history. We are entering our 70th year and you can see that we've grown exponentially over these 70 years. I have been CEO for the last eight years. I've been with the organization going on my 15th school year, and we have just grown exponentially during these 15 years. When I first got to Oceanside, we had 250 youth we were serving a day. Um, Pre-COVID, we were serving 4,200 youth a year and nearly 1,400 a day. So we just had this enormous expansion. And I'll I always like to preface it by saying I am a former classroom educator. So uh, we began to put some tight uh, uh, guidelines and, and expectations around what the kids were actually experiencing when they were coming to our club. Next slide, please. This shows a little bit of our, our pre-COVID numbers. As I mentioned, pre-COVID, sorry, we did 4,200 a year during COVID, we actually were just really blessed to be open. Uh, we opened our doors um, May 4th of 2020. We were, we were the only uh, organization to actually have, to open for summer camp June, 2020. Um, so we served 2,300 youth. And again, I'm a glass full kind of gal. At least we were open and able to serve youth. Um, it was definitely hard not to be able to serve the numbers that we normally do. It can give you an idea of our demographics. You'll see on the, I think it's your lower left corner, um, the gender, 53% male, 47% female. Typically during a normal year without COVID, we're usually right down the center, 50-50 or 49-51. Um, so you can see that during COVID, we had a little bit more uh, males than females. Next slide, please. And this just shows a, a bit more deeper dive into the demographics. Again, this is during COVID. You can see the number of teens are really low. In a normal year, that's usually around 2,200, 2,100 teens that we're serving. But during COVID, the focus was really on that elementary level. And for obvious reasons, they were unable to learn from Zoom by themselves. So being able to come into a facility that was open from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day and provide that virtual learning, distance learning, 
was critical, especially given the demographics that I shared with you. Next slide, please. During uh, the, when COVID first hit, um, you know, it, the whole world shut down as we all know. Um, and we reached out to all 4,200 youth within that first week. And what we found, and we were up and running actually virtually within that first week as well. But what we heard from them was really heartbreaking. We heard that they were hungry because again, thinking about our demographics, schools closed so kids were not able to get meals. Um, and what I haven't shared with you is that we built a center for innovation that included a culinary arts teaching kitchen, a performing arts center and a stream lab. And um, during that time period, uh, we had to shift from doing our culinary arts program and we opened it up to do curbside meals and we were able to serve 55,000 youth. Next slide, please. You can scroll through these. You'll see some of the pictures um, of activities that we do with our youth. Um, we did build the stream lab and um, about 10 years ago, we started a streaming ahead program uh, and you can just continue to hit uh, enter and, and, oh, I guess it won't show the pictures. That's okay. Um, uh, we opened a stream lab. It stands for science, technology, research, engineering, arts, and math. And the reason why we added the R in is that we felt that you know, in this day and age with everything moving so quickly, kids were not pausing to actually try something, fail, go back, redo and try again. So we added the R in for this pause moment of maybe you need to go back and research and it's okay if you, if you, if it, you fail because that's what makes us actually come up with even better ideas. Uh, so we started a streaming ahead program AAUW has been amazing. You've supported us two years and uh, being able to provide girls with the opportunity to be specifically engaged in science, technology, research, engineering, arts and math, all the subjects that girls tend to stay away from because they think they are less than. So we are really excited to be able to provide this opportunity. And I'm gonna wrap it up because I know I can talk about this all day. I do what I love, I love what I do. And I'm really excited to be here today. And I'm sorry that I had some technology issues. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. And don't worry about the technology issues. Those things just happen. So don't worry about that. But thank you very much. And best of luck with all of that you're doing in Oceanside. We'll be anxious to hear about it. OK, thank you. And now next, I would like to introduce an American fellow, Allison Zuba. And Allison is studying at the University of California in Irvine. And she is a language and literature English student. And she is going to talk to us about rhetoric and composition. Her fellowship is sponsored by Harriet Maurer, Nora Harris Perry, and Patricia Stilwell. So congratulations, Allison, take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction, Diane, and thank you very much to AUW California and to everyone who has helped make this possible. Um, just as a fun anecdote, when I was a high schooler and a Girl Scout, I attended the AAUW National Convention in Phoenix, and it was a really cool experience. I presented um, with a, a peer of mine uh, on ways of engaging young women in um, activism and political engagement. and. Um, it's great to have this full circle and be, be back uh, doing work with AUW. So today I'm going to just give a really brief um, overview of the kinds of things that I'm working on in my um, PhD research. I am a candidate at UCI um, specializing in rhetoric and composition. So roughly writing communication. Um, next slide, please. One of my key terms is rhetorical education. So uh, historically, um, at least those of us in the Western world, we see this rooted in ancient Greece and Rome. And the image on the right side is actually from an 18th century copy of Quintilian's Institutes of Oratory, which was a, um, a text in ancient Rome, um, early uh, common era that was aimed at teaching young uh, male citizens on how to speak. 
Um, and the idea behind rhetorical education in this tradition is that it's training citizens to engage meaningfully in their communities. So that might be as lawyers, as politicians, um, giving, giving public talks. Um, and we see this tradition continuing in the contemporary US university. Um, but of course it is changing because we have different people attending school, learning how to speak and write. Um, and it's, it's uh, engaging all kinds of different um, speaking and writing traditions and not just ancient Greece and Rome. Could you please uh, go to the next slide? Thank you. So my interest is in the extracurriculum or extracurricular activities of college students. Um, so on the right, you'll see a photo from my archival research um, into the UCI archives looking at student publications. And this is a, a coverage of a 1990 uh, protest of the UCI uh, housing policy that did not allow uh, same-sex partners to live together in family housing. So I'm really interested in the ways that students, um, especially those who have not been um, welcomed into the halls of learning historically, so um, white women, women and men of color um, who are finding ways to feel like they belong in these institutions. And a lot of what they do is through um, these extracurricular activities, writing for student newspapers, uh, joining groups that have, um, in my study, I'm interested in uh, with feminist, LGBT, or a race or ethnicity identity um, orientation. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll leave you with this, this small uh, tidbit uh, excerpt from the Women's Quarterly, which was a feminist oriented student publication. Um, I look specifically at the late 80s and early 90s context. It did run through the early um, 21st century. Um, so in this statement, uh, it says it's it's a position statement. Um, the Women's Quarterly is a creative forum written by radical women. Um, and so it's really interesting to me to study the student writing, um, which is self-sponsored, which is to say students weren't getting credit for this um, course credit. This is something they did in their free time, um, got together, said, I wanna be a part of this. Um, and look at what kinds of language they're using, um, how they're positioning themselves rhetorically um, within the campus context and within the world. Um, and in this case, within other um, social justice movements, they say challenging patriarchal, capitalist, white supremacist, heterosexist, ageist, and other oppressive institutions. And I'm really impressed and um, I find a lot of inspiration from the type of really engaged and um, critical work that students are doing in the extracurriculum. Uh, and last slide. Thank you. So I'm uh, really appreciate your time and happy to answer questions more about my, my work. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you, Allison. And that was very interesting, your early introduction to AUW. That was, that's fantastic. So thank you and best of luck in everything you're doing. That sounds very interesting. Okay, so we will now move on to Jessica Gutierrez Massini. And she is an American fellow. She has an, Amer has an American fellowship and she's studying at the University of California at Riverside. Her discipline is music. So through engagement, dance and compassionate listening, Jessica explores the two intertribal indigenous practices, dance and powwow and how that reflects transnational indigenous identities, values, and expressions. She is studying under the fellowship named for Anita Miller and Jeanette Muse Miller and Maytreat Morrison. And Jessica, take it away. Jessica said she was having some trouble with her computer. So are you there, Jessica? I am. I don't see me. We can see, see you. Oh, yeah, that's good. okay. That's fine. If you see me, that's fine. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And we see your slide. So okay. you're in good shape. All right. Can I have the next slide, please? Mia Juan Umon, Ne Natal, Jessica Magrita, Gutierrez Messini, Ne Hiwakao, Marina Valley, Na. Pen, Nen, Nepulive, Orange, Na. 
Hello everyone, my name is Jessica and I live in Moreno Valley and was born in Orange, California. I introduced myself in Kauia, one of the indigenous languages to this area. Kauia is not my language, but I do this as a way of introducing and thanking the peoples whose land I'm speaking from today. I also acknowledge the Serrano, Luceno, and Tongva peoples as neighboring and overlapping tribal lands and waterways. Slide, please. Week by week, I'm learning more about the history and complexities between danza and indigenous music, dance, and group spiritual practice from Mexico and powwow, a North American intertribal music and dance celebration. My ethnographic project follows the lived experiences of danza dancers, danzantes, and local powwow communities where I explore the intersections between identity, place, and decolonizing strategies. My dissertation answers the following questions. Why are danzantes invited to powwows and how do they choose what events to participate in? What are the arguments both for and against danza's presence in powwows? And lastly, how has danza in powwow spaces changed intertribal relations in the Southwestern United States, including notions of indigenous identity and decolonial praxis? I am drawn to danza and powwow because they temporarily reclaim a given space. Indigenous peoples transform it into a place to annually practice traditions, honor the land, and freely express themselves as indigenous peoples. Since they are open to the public and often bring in outside spectators, powwows simultaneously bring awareness to indigenous people's experiences, histories, and life ways, thereby breaking colonial stereotypes. I pay close attention to the ways the master of ceremonies introduces danzantes and contextualizes their place as Native Americans. I listen to the words of Donzante representatives who are often given the microphone to speak for themselves, explain their dance practice, regalia, and why they continue their traditions. Next slide, please. I'm going to um, have to reshare because you have a video. So hang on just a moment. Um, don't play the video just yet. <laughs> So I want to share um, one of my first powwows here in Southern California. The MC Bobby Whitebird describes California's multiple colonizers and how it separated indigenous peoples and continues to do so by enforcing a deadly border wall. As the trusted spokesman of the powwow, his words are often heard by audiences as wisdom and truth. As audiences learn indigenous peoples experiences, sentiments might grow into feelings of solidarity and belonging particularly for those of unrecognized indigenous heritage as displayed by this man's fist during the MC speech. I always go back to this moment because it was a powerful display of, I'm here too, and I stand for this. When moments like this are combined with encouragement from elders to go back and learn your history, your language, the Powell space educates and encourages decolonial strategies between indigenous and non-indigenous audiences. Now, if you can play about a minute, please. People are here well. When Columbus came over in 1492, and then the Spires came, the genocide that we faced but we're here today, alive and well. Show that honor and respect here at this university as they get stronger and they help their people. Help all people because we're all related. Mexico and the United States was not separated until 1842 at the Treaty of Guadalupe. At the Treaty of Guadalupe, California was sold. And they say they're going to put that wall up. You cannot stop the natural order. The natural order of mankind coming across. Coming across for hundreds of thousands of years. They have evidence 
that many, many of our indigenous people were in St. Louis, in that area. Perfect, thank you. I'd also like to note that this is just one interaction and not all receptions by members and spectators are this positive. While only a select number of powwows invite danzantes, the degree to which they participate in the powwow varies. These questions, whether danza belongs in the powwow or, even, or are even considered indigenous practitioners is a testament to the social and political consequences of ongoing colonialism. Slide please. I frame my work within the ongoing movement to decolonize the academy by centering Indigenous voices and approaches to research. Maori education scholar Linda Tuivai Smith is my primary research guide for decolonizing methodologies. Smith not only links the history of colonialism and imperialism to Indigenous genocide and oppression, but encourages Indigenous research and methodologies. I am deeply tied to the communities I do research with and for. Therefore, I am aware of the historical trauma still present in the minds of indigenous and other oppressed communities who have endured being under the gaze of the academy. Interdisciplinary and community-based approaches like mine are crucial and can serve as ethical models for future researchers. In this project led by decolon decolonizing strategies, my continued listening, volunteering, and approaches led with compassion speak to my goals of developing projects that serve the community and their needs as they see fit. Decolonization does not mean we can undo or forget the centuries of ongoing colonialism. However, in these processes, we can create a future based on stewardship and reciprocity. Last slide. Achima, thank you. I'm also here if you have any questions in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. I don't know if there are any questions in the chat or not, but thank you very much. How interesting, really, really fascinating work. So thank you for that and best wishes. And our next speaker is Becky, Becky Machado. No, Dana, Dana, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Dana, I, I didn't have your, your paper here. So anyway, Dana is an American fellow from the University of California and Berkeley in history. And she is going to talk about the gardens for health and wealth in public health and work in the New Deal South. So welcome, Dana. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction, Ms. Owens. And good morning, everyone. And thank you all for being here today. Um, I also want to just begin by extending special thanks to W California for hosting this session and to Ms. Meyer and Ms. Gabe for their time and support in organizing our slides for this session. Um, my name is Dana Landris and I am a sixth year doctoral candidate in the history department at the University of California, Berkeley. My dissertation is entitled Gardens for Health and for Wealth, Pellegra and Women's Public Health Work in the New Deal South. And I have to say, it's a really interesting moment to be working on the history of public health in general and disease outbreaks more specifically, since we have all been so collectively navigating life together during a pa pandemic these past 18 months. So what I'd like to do in our next few minutes uh, is share with you a story about another pandemic that occurred right here in the United States less than a century ago, but that has largely been uh, forgotten and left out of history books, but which I believe carries important resonance and lessons for the present moment. Pellagra is a nutritional deficiency disease caused by a deficiency of the vitamin niacin B3, which is found naturally in lean meat, milk, eggs, and leafy green vegetables. Although pellagra has a much longer history in Europe, dating back to the 18th century, it was only first recognized by the American medical community in 1906, when a severe outbreak in Alabama led doctors to identify its presence for the first time in the United States. Symptoms of pellagra include painful red skin lesions as shown in the clinical picture here nausea, diarrhea, chronic fatigue, weight loss, and if left untreated, cognitive degeneration and death. Pellagra was widely considered inseparable from poverty, leading one physician to a Pellagra attaches itself to the body, as does a shadow to the body. 
By the onset of World War I, plague girl was one of the leading causes of death in the United States, only behind tuberculosis and influenza. Although available epidemiological data tends to be sporadic from the early 1900s, our best estimates place the total mortality from this disease at three and a half million, although the actual number is quite likely to be much higher. Almost immediately following its discovery in the United States, Pelagra was categorized by the American medical community as a uniquely Southern problem. Although it had in fact been documented in Northern and Midwestern communities, its incident rate was most staggering across states in the Deep South, as you can see from the map here, which illustrates Pelagra deaths per 100,000 in 1930 in the United States. Next slide, please. So why the American South? The maps that you see here were published by the renowned sociologist Howard Odom in 1930, who mapped out, in, I'm sorry, in 1936, who mapped out the incidence rate of pellagra in Mississippi and decided to compare this to the rates of cotton tenancy throughout the state. As you can see, counties which had the highest rates of cotton tenancy and sharecropping were also those counties that had the highest mortality rates from pellagra. Keen observers began to notice that the disease was uniquely tied to cotton monoculture in a variety of ways. It was a disease that was made possible by low wages, arduous agricultural working conditions, an insufficient and monotonous diet, and labor that left no time or energy for subsistence garden cultivation. And this is a really important thing to recognize because I argue it is the first time in American public health history that doctors begin to wonder whether systemic poverty could be tangibly linked to poor health outcomes. Next slide, please. In a few words, I'd like to now briefly share with you a traditional historical narrative of pellagra eradication in the United States. In 1914, the US Public Health Service sent a young New York physician pictured here by the name of Dr. Joseph Goldberger on a tour to document this disease across the American South. Goldberger believed that pellagra was caused by a poor diet and he championed this causation hypothesis, believing that better nutrition could cure pellagra in Southern communities, among sharecroppers in particular. His theory was eventually borne out after his death. In the late 1930s, pellagra was identified as being caused by a deficiency of a vitamin niacin B3. As a result of this, bread companies began to enrich flour with niacin, as it still is today so that by the end of the Second World War, pellagra had largely vanished from the minds and memories of those across the United States. Next slide, please. By and large, this is an accurate story of the history of pellagra. However, I argue that it's not a complete one. Nearly all published works on this disease have failed to attend to the community-based healthcare infrastructure, which fundamentally supported pellagra patients in rural communities across the United States. At the onset of World War I, as men were sent to fight at home and abroad, women were encouraged to fight the health wars at home by growing home gardens, preserving food, and in turn, combating nutritional disease, particularly in rural communities. And what you see here are two posters from the World War I and World War II eras about food preservation and nutrition. Next slide, please. But we have to ask an important question. Who is missing from these narratives of early public health? What does it mean to write women intentionally back into the history of public health? I'd like to share with you a few photographs of these women working in the field, in part because they have been largely excluded from our histories of public health, simply because they didn't possess formal medical degrees or licensure. My research offers a brief revisionist history of plague prevention that is more attentive to the grassroots public health work undertaken by black and white women, particularly in rural communities. My findings suggest that these female agricultural extension agents engaged in intentional on the ground nutrition education, yes, as a means to eradicate pellagra, but also to help subvert the adverse economic and health impacts that were caused by cotton tenancy and sharecropping. Ultimately, by framing these agents as legitimate community-based healthcare practitioners, my research offers a more inclusive and a more accurate narrative of early public health work in the United States. And we can scroll through the next few pictures, please. 
these are from the Farm Security Administration and the, uh, we can go through the next one, thank you, rehabilitation program. This is a women's nutrition and gardening club in Durham, North Carolina. Next slide, please. So I'd like to end by playing for you a very brief clip of one of these women who's pictured here on the left, Mrs. Annie Schamberg, who conducted her own pellagra prevention campaign in Gee's Bend, Alabama. This photo shows Mrs. Schamberg teaching a 14-year-old young girl whose name was Viola Petaway how to grow a family garden, how to preserve foods. Thanks to Mrs. Schamberg's consistent public health efforts, despite the fact that she had no medical degree, she cured young Viola from a very, very bad case of pellagra. And if we can just click for just a moment there, if we can play about a minute of the audio, you'll hear Ms. Schamberg um, describing her work. Just a moment, it looks like it will not play that way. Let me try something else. Let me try sharing. Um, my apologies. It and if we can't, it's not a problem at all. I'm sorry, it's it's not playing. Okay, all right. Well, um, perhaps perhaps at a, at a different time, but I'll just end by saying that by writing women back into the history of public health work, I think it becomes possible to expand our idea of who counts as healthcare practitioners, and especially in this moment in the current pandemic, to recognize that health and healing practices do not just occur in the clinic or in the hospital, but they happen on the ground in our own communities, where I believe that everyone can participate in building healthier and more sustainable futures together. Thank you so much, AAUW California, and I look forward to questions and conversations. Thank you, Dana. That's extraordinary. Very, very interesting, especially at this time. So thank you for your work on that. That's great. Okay, and now we're going to move on to an international fellow, Becky Machado. And Becky is studying at Northeastern University, and she is from Kenya. And she is, her discipline is computer and information sciences. She's a graduate student and she's passionate about the intersection of women and technology. So she's combining her background in applied mathematics and computer science to study the impact algorithms have on women. And we've certainly, certainly heard a lot about that just lately. So welcome, Becky. There we go, unmute. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Um, hi everyone, my name is Becky. Um, I did my undergrad in applied mathematics from UC Berkeley, and I am currently doing my master's in computer science um, at Northeastern. Um, so yeah, so my interest has already been sort of revealed to everyone. I'm interested in that intersection of, um, of women and AI, and particularly how, um, how, how algorithms Algorithms tend to impact uh, women and other um, uh, uh, other uh, groups, um, minority groups. Um, and so, just a quick background of who I am, and I'll try to speed things up because this can get very lengthy. <laughs> um, yeah, so I am from a very beautiful, beautiful village off of the coast of East Africa. Um, and uh, growing up, you know, uh, we all have different experiences, right, or similar experiences. But growing up, the aspect of um, uh, uh, the aspect of wars and ethnic cleansing uh, wasn't very foreign to me, right? Um, and if you if if you have no idea what ethnic cleansing is you can think of um, or maybe you can google perhaps the Rwandan genocide is one example of uh, an ethnic uh, type of ethnic cleansing or what you call genocide that happened uh, back in the 90s so I remember growing up when I was a child um, so one particular ethnic cleansing was going on was happening and in that particular scenario um, uh, my uh, my parents are from two different ethnicities right and so where we lived that that was the home of um, uh, that was the indigenous home of um, um, of my of my paternal uh, parent, right? Um, of my dad, uh, but then my mom was from a different uh, a different indigenous 
play she was from somewhere else basically she was foreign in that particular on that particular line and so this war started happening you know with the ethnic cleansing war started happening and at that point my mom um uh among other women you you, you know you might think of all these other women who were married into that land all other women they sort of were fearing for their life right because here they are they've been forced out to have children there and all this sort of fearing for their life and so um that just got me thinking you know Right now, I'm thinking back um, in, in such situations of wars and uh, ethnic cleansing is, is a type of war, right? In such situations of wars, women tend to get the 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 the, 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 the women tend to get it really worse, right? Women and children tend to get it really worse. And wars do happen everywhere, right? A nation against nation, right? You can think of US and Iraq. Um, it can happen between uh, a neighbor, be, between neighbors, between brothers, between sisters, between uh, nations, between communities. In our case, there's a community, right? And so this just got me thinking about, well, this is, this is the history of how wars do happen, right? Women and children especially tend to get, you know, the negative side of things. Um, and then, but then now in the age of technology, that has amplified everything. As we have seen AI in general, it's amplified the negative things that happen in society. It's amplified the bias against women, right? Um, as we, as we, you know, as we all know that right now, a woman, a woman has a much lower chance of get of getting uh, of getting employment if they apply online. And the system of online uses AI to sort of sift through sift through applications. A woman has um, a woman has a much lower chance that than than a fellow male counterpart to. Get get accepted into that application pool, right? Because of the AI's bias. So AI, is, it's a great technology, but it also has its downside, whereby it does amplify what the negatives that, that already exist in society, how, women, how, how humans think, because humans create the AI, right? And so just going back into the space of wars, um, uh, wars happening between nations, between communities, um, but then more so on a larger scale, wars between nations, right? Between a, a nation X and another nation Y. Um, in this day and age of technology, whereby technology is already being used in the armies, right? We do have um, AI technology that's been used, uh, that's already been deployed into, into the war zones. And just thinking about how AI can be biased and, and how women do suffer from, uh, uh, do suffer in society uh, from, from um, AI itself, the negative, you know, the downside of AI, just combining the two, right? A, a war zone area uh, and the, an army using AI, and then how that impact would will be like on women and children in general um, sort of got me interested in that in that aspect because um, yeah so it's sort of like uh, my passion of, on we of women and my uh, my interest in in AI in general math and computer science and sort of combining the two and thinking well what can I do in this case so comes in computer vision computer vision is um, it's it's some sort of AI that that's used to detect people, right? It detects faces. It can detect a person. It can det uh, if you, if you have an auto an autonomous car, right? A driverless car. It's used some it uses com some computer vision to detect a pedestrian so that your car doesn't crash into a pedestrian, right? And so I'm thinking, well, right now we are already deploying um, AI into the war zone areas, right? And mostly it's computer vision technology that's been that's been deployed into the war zone area, whereby maybe you have, um, for example a drone the drone is supposed to detect that this is a human being uh, I'm not supposed to like you know shoot them or bomb them right I'm supposed to bomb a building structure not a human being something like that right so I'm specifically looking at how how I can um, how I can um, um, how I can help this 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 the framing of this computer vision technology uh, for armies spe uh, for specifically so that they're not uh, so that the women on the ground in this war street areas they don't get uh you know the downside again of of, um, of the AI technology and the wars. So that's just what um, uh, what um, I'm sort of framing my, uh, my my work into, and it's going to continue into a PhD as well. Um, so, I mean, hopefully I, I do continue, continue that into a PhD. As of now, I've, I've just been working on things that are um, uh, other areas of where algorithms do intersect with women. For example, you know, uh, women applying to, job, uh, to, to jobs online and they don't get accepted because the AI sort of uh, denies them that entry into the into the job portals or applications. So I'm sort of like working on smaller projects that 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 help me build up into that 
big uh, the, the the bigger picture of of, of uh, uh, AI in in war stricken areas. Um, yeah, and then a, a little bit of what else. Um, I do what other passions I have is that I, I, I do give back to, um, or rather I do, since I am passionate about women, especially younger women, um, I do uh, mentorship for girls in STEM, especially girls from marginalized uh, marginalized communities. So I, I, I started with my own, my, with, with, my, with my own community back in East Africa. And I do have, I do hold some mentorship for the girls. Um, and I'll drop a link in the chat as well. Feel free to go through our website and just have a few of it but i i love mentoring young girls who haven't been exposed or who are in privilege to know about computers to know about um computer science um just to expose them to this is a world out there's a huge world out there in math and technology and stem in general even sciences right in engineering this is what you could dream of and i help them walk through that i mentor them i give them free classes um but of course by the help of donors and um i i just expose them you know i help them apply to to different places and get the funding to different places so that they can also dream big because i was i was once in their shoes whereby i couldn't i i dreamt big but i couldn't have the means to get out of that um that bubble and so yeah i believe um yeah i i think my time is up so uh thank you so much uh for having me here thank you Thank you very much, Becky. That was that was fabulous. Great, great. I love going back and helping the girls. So that's that's fantastic. And I forgot to mention that your uh, fellowship is funded by Juanita Teach Massa, Charles Wyatt, and Faye Savage, and Joe Harberson. So those women are all funding your work and uh, continue it. It's great. Thank you very much, Becky. And now our second international fellow is Kay McKinney. Kay McKinney, uh, like I said, is an international fellow at the University of California in Los Angeles. She's from the Bahamas and she is studying engineering biomedical. Very fascinating work. And I'm especially uh, honored to introduce Kay to you because she is studying under my international fellowship, the Diana Owens International Fellowship, and the Redlands California Branch International Fellowship. So welcome back, Kay. Thank you, thank you. So I wanted to start by saying good morning to everybody. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Ms. Owens, for that lovely introduction. And thank you for my international fellowship as well. So I'm currently a first year master's student at the University of California, Los Angeles, and I am studying bioengineering. So I'm on the thesis track and my research will be focused around drug delivery. Next slide, please. So the heart is composed of cardiac muscle and it's responsible for pumping oxygen rich blood around the body through blood vessels called arteries. The coronary arteries are found on the surface of the heart, and they're very vital as they basically supply the heart with the necessary oxygen that it needs so that it can function properly. Coronary heart disease is the narrowing of the coronary arteries due to plaque buildup, which we can see in the second picture to the right, and this causes the, it limits blood flow to the heart. So this can lead to shortness of breath, chest pain, a stroke, or potentially a heart attack. And according to the World Health Organization, a research study performed in 2018 actually found that the primary cause of death in the Bahamas was coronary heart disease, which accounts for approximately 14% of all deaths my country experiences. Next slide, please. So normally with severe coronary heart disease, a doctor would place a stent inside of the blocked coronary artery, and it basically prevents the artery from closing up and it creates a wider pathway for the blood to effectively flow through. However, according to the Cleveland Clinic, medication can be used to either stop or slow the progression of coronary artery disease. So many different types of medication can be used to help in this area. 
For example, beta blockers, they slow the heart rate and lower blood pressure, which decreases the amount of oxygen the heart needs and therefore reduces the workload of the heart. And all of this prevents a stroke or like I mentioned before, a heart attack. Now, cholesterol modifying medication, this can reduce the buildup of plaque and nitroglycerin can dilate the coronary arteries and this reduces the heart's demand for blood helping with the overall workload of the cardiac muscle. So with this information, my love for the medical field and my passion for helping my country, I recently became interested in researching a targeted drug delivery technique that can aid in clearing up plaque buildup in the coronary arteries. Next slide, please. So during my undergraduate research career at Penn State University, I examined various nanoparticles with a laser and microscope. The nanoparticles that I examined and those that are pictured here were nanoliposomes, ronamine B, and ronamine 6G. So a nanoliposome is a lipid bilayer vesicle that is used for the encapsulation and delivery of bioactive agents such as antibiotics. It has an aqueous core, and this is where drugs are placed, and then it has a hydrophilic and hydrophobic lipid bilayer. Now, nanoliposomes are extremely useful in drug delivery due to the type of drugs they are able to carry. They can carry very soluble drugs or they can carry drugs that are non-soluble. Now, rhodamine B and rhodamine 6G are water tracer fluorescent dyes, which I would like to use in potentially imaging or tracking the movement of these nanoliposomes. Therefore, with the combination of my experience from undergrad, hopefully I can perform this targeted drug delivery so that the medication can go directly to and be fully used by the intended diseased area of the body, in the body, which would be the coronary arteries. Next slide, please. So in order to perform targeted drug delivery, the nanoparticles must be properly designed. So the nanoparticle will have a protective coating and that basically will encapsulate the aqueous core that has the intended medication. This will be done to ensure that there's no loss in concentration as it's transported directly to the diseased area. Ligands, which are basically molecules that will interact with receptors on targeted cells, will be placed on the outside of the protective coating. And the aim of my project is for the nanoliposome to carry the drug directly to the coronary arteries, and then the ligands will bond with receptors at that target site, and it'll allow for direct delivery of the encapsulated drug. Next slide, please. So once again, thank you for your time and watching us this morning. Thank you for your attention. And I want to thank all of the speakers for joining me and AAW, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. That was, that was wonderful. Yes. Yeah, so your country is going to be very pleased to have you back and have you help them. So we appreciate that. That's what I love about the International awesome. Fellows. They go back to help make the world a better place. So thank you very much. Thank right. you. Thank you. So now I'm going to turn the program over to our AUW fund chair, um, Lynn Batchelor. Thank you, Diane. <clears throat> thank you all for joining us today. What a fantastic day it's already been, and you have a treat and that there will be six more wonderful women for you to meet. The first person I'd like to introduce is Brenna Mockler. She's an American fellow, and she's, uh, her discipline is physics. She has a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics. She's studying at UC Santa Cruz, and her topic is probing supermassive black holes and tidal disruption events. And she's sponsored by Morgan Hill, Irene and Barbara Kate, Marie Walbach, and Contra Costa County, Danville Branch. Thank you, Brenna. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. 
Great. Okay. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, so, and also thank you so much for, for having us. I'm, I'm really excited to be talking with you all. So I just thought I would give you a brief overview of my research because I think it's something that most people don't think too much about. Um, and I just wanted to start it by saying that one of the things I love most about studying astrophysics is the really beautiful perspective it gives for me on life on Earth, because remembering how big the universe is and how powerful it can be reminds me how small and fragile the Earth is. And it's also a really good reminder of how much we have in common with other humans and really all life on Earth, for which for me at least inspires a sense of camaraderie and a feeling that we just need to take care of each other and work together because we're just this tiny part of a much bigger universe. So on that note, I'll tell you some about my research on black holes, which are a particularly dramatic and powerful uh, type of object in the universe. Um, so when I talk about my research, I always point out that black holes are actually fairly simple, which might sound pretty crazy because they are very extreme dramatic objects. Um, and they certainly are in popular culture in movies like Interstellar, but uh, it turns out that we only need a few things, we only need to know a few things about them to be able to characterize them completely. Uh, the main thing we need to know about them is their, the mass, the, how much they weigh. So if someone tells me how much black hole weighs, I'm able to describe the black hole pretty well. And so I really like this quote by Barton Rees, black holes are simpler than forests. Um, because, and so, so Martin Rees is a British astrophysicist who has informed um, a lot of the research in my discipline. Um, and so the reason I like this quote is because if someone had just told you that they had visited a forest and described it by purely the, um, how much the trees weigh, you wouldn't really know that much about it. You wouldn't be able to tell us the types of trees or the types of uh, animals in the forest or what sort of ecosystem it is. Um, and so in a lot of ways, life on earth is a lot more complicated than black holes. Um, and so even though they seem really extreme, they're actually, they, they, can, be, they can be easier to describe. Um, but despite the simplicity, they influence the entire evolution of galaxies. They determine whether stars can form. Um, they also provide really extreme examples of Einstein's theory of general relativity. And so they let us kind of test the bounds of that theory in ways that we can't do in our own, own solar system. Um, so can I have the next slide? Thank you. So these are a couple of the questions that have informed my research. Um, one is how do black holes uh, actually get to be so large? Because the ones in the centers of galaxies are um, millions of times more massive than our solar system. Um, and then another thing is how can we find more of them? Because as the name suggests, they do not emit light. And so, um, so we find them from their influence on the surrounding stars. Um, we can't look at them directly. Can I see the next slide? So just to give you a sense of scale, um, when black holes first form, they form from dying stars. Um, but the largest stars, if the largest stars are the size of this cute little uh, flying squirrel here, then the black holes that we see at the centers of galaxies are the size of blue whales. And so they start out as these like tiny flying squirrels and somehow need to grow to the size of whales. And it's been, um, it's pr proved very difficult to understand how this happens uh, theoretically. And so I have done lots of studies to try to understand this better. Um, and so can we see the next slide? And so a lot of my work has been studying how black holes grow and watching them grow. And it turns out that they're very messy eaters. So we can use telescopes to discover them and watch them grow as they're pulling in a uh, gas that surrounds them. We call this process mass accretion. And so you guys might've seen this kind of eye of Sauron like picture um, of the black hole in the center of our galaxy and the, the, the orange stuff um, is actually the accretion disk surrounding the black hole. So it's a disk of mass and gas that the black hole that is orbiting the black hole and the black hole is slowly pulling in. And so even though we can't actually see the black hole directly, we can see it as it's eating the mass around it. And so um, can you see the next slide? I'm gonna to have to stop sharing and share again so that we can share the video piece of it. Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay, thank you. 
Um, and so I found a couple of videos on the internet that I think provide a really good picture of how these black holes actually grow. And so first, actually, before I before we start the video, I'd like you to imagine a uh, coin in a wishing well, um, which I know I really enjoyed doing when I honestly still enjoy doing, enjoy doing it when I was a kid, um, is watching the coin slowly circle around and eventually fall into the center. And the reason it uh, eventually falls into the center is that it's losing energy due to the friction between the coin and the wishing well. And so this slows it down and it slowly falls in. And if it was perfectly frictionless, if there, um, then it would actually just continue orbiting around the center of that coin well forever. And this is similar to what happens when gas is orbiting around a black hole. It needs to lose energy to fall in. And so that's why this, um, this analogy that I'm gonna show you, the marbles in a wishing well is actually, I think a much better example because you can see all of the, if you think of the marbles as gas or stars around the black hole, then you can see them hit each other, lose energy and funnel into the black hole. Um, so can you play the video? Oh, is it? I think, I think if you just click play, oh, okay. Um, I cut it. Okay, I'll just let you know when to stop. It. You can see they start out circling around slowly, they interact. You can pause it now. I don't need to see the larger ones. If you could pause it and go back to the slide, that would be great. Thank you. Um, sorry. Um, yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So the marbles are orbiting around. They they start to hit each other. They lose energy. They fall in. And this is exactly what happens to gas that is circling a black hole in its accretion disk. And that's how it eventually the black hole eventually eats it. Um, can we go to the next slide? Do you so I was going to show a different clip from later on in the video, but I think perhaps if, if it's not, if we can't show it in the slide, then I think it'll go to the wrong part of the video. So we can, we can skip it. That's fine too. Um, yeah. And so the next thing I wanted to show you is a computer model of a black hole eating debris from a star. Um, and I think it actually looks pretty similar to the process of marbles um, circling around and eventually falling in to the black hole. Um, so you could play the video, hopefully. You can watch it on the internet, that works too. Um, yeah, so this is a sim simulation from a collaborator of mine. Um, and it's actually, it's a very similar process. So, so the gases from the stars orbiting around and you can see it fall in and eventually, and eventually most of it is eaten by the black hole. And so um, the reason the Marvel example works well is because it's also gravity falling in, um, gravity pulling, pulling the marbles in. Um, but what do we actually see from telescopes? Unfortunately, we do not see this beautiful, um, <laughs> this beautiful video um, that's just from a computer model. What we actually see is just the increase in brightness from the energy released as the mass falls into the black hole, as it hits itself and eventually falls in. Um, and this goes on for some number of days. And so we can look at the shape of this curve in a telescope, which really is just like a, a, an extended, uh, a brightening and then a dimming of light. Um, so it's relatively simple, but it encodes a lot of information. So if we go to the next slide, um, what we find is that the brightness is dependent on the amount of mass eaten, which could make sense. Um, if more mass is hitting itself and falling in, then the, it's brighter. And the time scale is dependent on the mass of the black hole. So just from a little bit of information from these flares of light, we can learn a lot about how black holes grow and about how large they are. Um, and that's, I think that's all for me. Thank you very much for having me. It's uh, been lovely to talk to you all. Thank you very much. That was a fascinating introduction to black holes. And thank you for pointing out to the connectedness that we have with each other. Sorry, I didn't quite get the video going. There you go. 
the connectedness with each other and with all of space. The next person I'd like to introduce you to is Julie Fun. She's an American fellow. She, her specialization is publications on Asian and Asian American studies. She's at Cal State Los Angeles. And her topic is the contours of care, the influence of pandemic, public health and Asian American communities in Southern California, 1918 to 1941. She's funded by the Southeast District, the Thousand Oaks 30th Anniversary Fund and Helen Adler. Thank you so much for being with us, Julie. Thank you so much for that lovely um, introduction. Uh, before I begin my presentation, I wanted to first say that I wanted to acknowledge that I'm working, living, and loving from Tongva territory, which was unceded. Um, I want to start with my own story. So, you know, I am part of the hundreds and thousands of refugees that were fleeing from the colonial wars in Southeast Asia in the 1970s and the 1980s. And one of the most poignant stories that I remember coming from my mother um, was that I was about um, I was about six months old. We were on a, a, a boat and we finally had landed on in the ports of Hong Kong. And she said that and was very angry about the fact that because I was a very sickly child, that the public health officials had taken these medicines and dumped them into the pier and then proceeded to chastise my mother for being backwards for using these herbal medicines. And that, you know, that this is something that she shouldn't do because um, modern medicine, you know, would help cure basically, you know, the woes of my people. Um, and so I wanted to first start with that particular story because in many ways it helped inform the way that I had entered into the academic profession. Um, I'd like to joke with some folks that I am a failed uh, medical student. And so instead of studying medicine, I study the history of medicine. Um, and so what ended up happening was that I, I began with a series of questions. And for me, these questions really were framed around number one, um, how did communities of color stay healthy? That's number one. Um, but and, and then moreover, um, how did this happen, especially during the influenza pandemic? Um, and at the time that I had formed these questions, I had not considered that we, we ourselves would be plunged into a pandemic. Uh, so it's a, it, um, as the previous speaker had talked about that this is a very interesting time for those of us who study pandemics. Um, so, and then the last question that I had was really how did we as Asian Americans participate in, in, in medicine because our, our population did not go away, um, but that there was very little literature that really reflected our, in our, our, our experiences um, and rather it was really a lot of male white public health officials that talked about us, um, talked about groups of color um, and especially talked about um, the Asian American community. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so when I went into the archives, I was very discouraged because what I noticed was that there weren't a lot of voices that emerged from, you know, these archives that were collected by uh, medical officials, that were collected by um, these health officials. But one thing that did come up and one, one of the ways in which kind of encouraged me to stay on this path was you'll notice that this picture, this beautiful picture of Dr. Batier. Uh, she was a Creole woman um, that worked in Los Angeles. She was a trained medical professional. And what she had said to in this letter that you see in front of you, what she had said to these medical officials during the pandemic was, you know, um, because there were letters that accused her basically of, of not paying her dues, that she answered back and, and basically told them that, you know, I was caring for my community and here's the, you know, here's the money that I, that is owed to you and you'll notice that I have always paid my dues. And what what inspired me about this particular letter and picture was the fact that women, women of color participated in the history of medicine and participated in ways that were untraditional um, for, for women of color and especially in Los Angeles and in California at the time. Next slide, please. 
And what you'll see is that there are two, the two avenues that I took in my own research was I looked at Asian Americans and the professionalization of Asian Americans in medicine. Uh, the first picture that you see here is Dr. Shigakawa, who was very well known in the Japanese American and white community for being a general practitioner. She was one of the first Asian American doctors um, that was accepted into USC and later practiced in Chicago before she returned to Los Angeles. Another avenue of care that I, I noticed was that, you know, in looking at not just advertisements, but actually looking at a lot of the literature and looking at newspapers was that um, Chinese American men were herbalists during this time and that their medicine, um, that their work treated not just other Chinese Americans, but treated actually other communities of color. And they were particularly popular with white women, um, many of whom sought their, sought their care, especially when it, it dealt with reproductive purposes that other doctors would not, would not care for them in that way. <laughs> Um, next slide, please. Um, for me, medicine, especially looking at the history of medicine, served as a bridge for me in looking at several other disciplines. Um, so that for me, I'm able to straddle these kind of fine lines between ethnic studies, uh, gender studies, um, looking at theory, especially um, historical theory, um, history itself, public health and medicine, and looking at ways in which um, communities of color practice radical care, because this is something that we don't often talk about when it comes to medicine, but actually how care look like. Um, next slide, please. And lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, my own work that goes beyond academics, because for me, it's not just about writing and research. Um, and I want to thank AAUW for, for providing, you know, the, the, the means in which to finish my writing this summer, especially. But for me, the inspiration and the aspiration and the care that is involved with this kind of work for me is really outside of this writing. So for me, the mentorship of young women of color is especially important and not just in, in ethnic studies studies or looking at history, but actually much of my much of the young women that I mentor as an assistant professor actually come from other disciplines who are looking for a place and looking for people who look like them. Um, the second part um, that I that I'm part of is I'm part of community care. So what this looks like for me is looking at health as something that is much broader than just medical attention, right? This is part of my activism. This is part of my work in my community um, so that the two interventions that I, I take are number one is to create green spaces for children um, and having my students be part of this, but also creating green spaces in which stewardship is something that is really important, especially um, in bringing back native plants and then also being able to grow edibles that are that, that are indigenous to um, folks of color. Um, the second intervention that I have is doing oral histories. So, and because for me, stories are really important, especially in, in, in thinking about medicine. Um, for me, I would not have been able to do my work had it not been for the oral histories that were provided um, at UCLA. And to this end, what I ended up doing was I created the, the one of the largest Asian American oral histories um, our archives at Cal State LA. And so that concludes my, my uh, presentation. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that, that folks have. Thank you so much, Julie. Not Thank only you. sharing your personal story, but also for the important research you're doing into healthcare in the Asian American community. The next person I'd like to introduce you to is Verana Rinda. Ramana Jato, she's an international fellow. Her citizenship is from Madagascar. She's at UC Berkeley. She's a PhD in integrative technology. And she's sponsored by Grace and Robert Underhill, Robert and Francis Foote, and the Women's University Club. Thank you for being here, Verana Rinda. Thank you so much, uh, Lynn, for this introduction. Um, do you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. Great. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Verna Rinja and I come from Madagascar. So today I'm going to talk about the project I expect to achieve throughout my PhD at UC Berkeley. 
and it is related to the, um, uh, the impacts of environmental changes on the persistence of vital biotic interactions. So to start with, biotic interactions is just like is just interactions between animals and animals or animals or plants just between living beings. So animal mediated seed dispersal is one of them. And it's a process through which animals eat fruits and then disperse their seeds away via their fecal materials. In the tropics, uh, more than 90% of the plant species depends on this process to regenerate and to persist since uh, millions of time until now. But um, more than 70% of the animals responsible for this regeneration is now threatened to extinction because of forest um, degradation and fragmentation. So it is now really important then to um, understand how these changes affect the populations of animals and then the dynamics of such interactions, because without these interactions, we could not have all of the services that natural ecosystems provide to us, like clean water, fresh air, enough food, and so on. Next slide, please. So I expect to conduct this project in Madagascar just because it's my home country, but also it's the world's second biodiversity hotspot. This means that the island harbors not only a high percentage of unique fauna and flora, but it also undergoes a high frequency of threats from human activities. And lately, if you hear about Madagascar and threat to nature, you're going to hear about many, many forest fires. Some are voluntary, some are accidental, but it really decreases the surfaces of forest in Madagascar, which threatens um, the survival of animals and the remnant forests. Next slide, please. Madagascar is also uh, a great venue to conduct such um, research objective because uh, animal mediated seed dispersal on the island is performed by the lemurs. Lemurs are our endemic group of primates and unfortunately, more than 80-90% of the species are not threatened to uh, extinction. And so far, they are responsible of up to 70% of the regeneration of plant species in rainforest in Madagascar. So if they go extinct, what would be the consequences for the forests? What would be the consequences for us humans? Next, next slide, please. And for my uh, project, I'd like to focus on these small, cute animals, the mouse lemurs. They are the world's smallest primates, and they only occur in Madagascar. And surprisingly, even though they weigh up to 60 grams when they are adults, um, they eat many, many fruits. And another thing that is really interesting about them, that they are able to live and thrive in degraded habitats. So I am really interested on seeing what could they bring to these degraded habitats and to the forest ecosystem in general as a seed dispersers. So um, that's um, pretty much like the the wall image of the PhD I'd like to achieve. Next slide, please. And specifically, I'd like to investigate whether the decline in their population in these habitats will affect their effectiveness as seed dispersal, or would, would it be the same because they are able to live there? And so I'd like to see the determine the change of the these habitats, the distance to which they could deposit this, the seeds of the fruits they eat, uh, all, and also the survival of the dedicated seeds when once they're deposited 
uh, somewhere. Uh oh, I think we have lost her. Okay, it looks like we may have lost her completely. Um, Lynn, do you want to move forward with the next speaker? It looks like she might have fallen off. All right, thank you very much. It was the part that we got to see was very interesting in making the connection between the lemurs, seed dispersal, reforestation projects. It's very, very important into our whole idea of climate change. The next person I'd like to introduce to you is Maria Salgado. She has a career development grant. She is a master of education in enrollment management and policy. She's studying at the University of California. Uh, she is uh, sponsored by San Clemente, Capistrano Bay, Nevada County, Isabel Hedrick, and Patricia Orme, Haywood Castro Valley, Redlands, Bernice Black, John Drew, Oakland Piedmont, Mary Hively, Half Moon Bay, 50th anniversary, plus 16 other individual donors who are not with us today. Thank you, Maria. Oh, thank you for that introduction, Lynn. Um, and I just wanna say thank you to all of the women who have been a part of today's um, conversation and putting it together, uh, Sandy, Pam, um, and all of you for your contributions and for funding all of the amazing work that we're presenting on today. Thank you so much. Uh, so as Lynn mentioned, um, I am in my master's program uh, recipient of a career grant at the University of uh, University of Southern California and the School of Education. And my program focuses on enrollment management and I'll be presenting on how I'm using this framework to create an approach for equitable college access and success practices. So I'll talk a little bit about what uh, enrollment management is overall and how we can use this framework to create equity in, in post-secondary education. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, so um, kind of a big picture, picture, enrollment management provides a framework um, that we can use to analyze the processes that impact every process that um, in college success. And that includes everything from uh, uh, every aspect of a student's experience in higher education from the point where they're discovering education and just exploring colleges and uh, exploring majors and exploring different, um, you know, potential opportunities for them to pursue a college education all the way through college graduation. My focus is specifically on admissions, pers persistence processes, and discussing the challenges and opportunities that affect college attainment for students from marginalized communities. So in this enrollment pyramid, that would be applicants, admits, and enrolled students. But as you can see, institutions can use this framework to set different agenda priorities. And, and when you look at it through an equity lens, you can really uh, find new ways to create outreach um, in different markets and finding prospective students. Um, and really the end goal for institutions, which, you know, what I argue is that um, we need to focus more on not only getting students into college, but also through college graduation, which is really important. So if we can go to the next slide. So the stakes that are high, and this is why um, it's so important to not just focus on college access, but also uh, make the commitment to promise college success. Um, firstly, uh, the stakes are high when it comes to higher education attainment. Um, one of the things that we know is that higher, uh, higher education um, increases the potential earnings uh, for individuals, which you know has significant impact for society. Um, uh, higher uh, students with higher education are able to to have higher earnings and therefore pay 
pay more taxes, which benefits everyone. Um, but we also need to address some societal needs. One of the things that we're seeing in enrollment management is that there's going to be a decline in the traditional college age, uh, college bound population by more than 15% beginning in 2026. And so this is an imperative need because the growth in population that we will see has been in students that have, um, ha have successfully been underserved. Um, and so that would be a growth in, in, his, in the Hispanic population, the low income population. Um, so that's something that institutions really need to rethink how they how they serve these populations. And the other thing is that it's time to realize the promise of the American dream. Uh, you know, for, for decades, we've said that higher education um, creates uh, a pathways to higher earning careers. So we need to de deliver on that promise. Next slide, please. So uh, these are some of the challenges, if you can go to the next slide, that, that um, I want to discuss. Uh, these are some of the policies and the practices that privilege students who already stand to benefit from today's post-secondary education system. And these policies have gone largely in challenge and are rooted in discriminatory hi uh, history in higher education. Um, legacy admissions, early admissions, merit scholarships, and the athletic scholarships for elite sports that are not broadly accessible such as lacrosse, um, tennis, um, and also the overemphasis on prestige over college rankings, specifically on the U.S. and News, News and World Report rankings. Um, college boards uni and uni uh, university presidents um, have a lot of, place a lot of emphasis on where their institutions are trending, which sometimes forces the decisions to focus more on student um, like student accomplishments and how that's typically measured is uh, high school grades and ACT scores. But we've also seen that standardized testing is not the best measure to determine whether a student is going to succeed in college. So really challenging what those practices have been historically and who is benefiting and who is being excluded in that process is really critical to providing equity and access. And the other thing that, that is important to, um, to address is that the financial aid that students have to uh, you know, our financial aid programs, uh, such as the Pell Grant, which is one of the largest uh, uh, federal, federally funded um, programs for college access, currently only covers about 30% of tuition and fees, and that's about 60% less than when the program started. So these are really issues that need to be addressed to be able to create that success that we want to see in students. Next slide, please. So this slide shows um, the dire need for to to really reevaluate those practices and also how we how institutions prioritize the resources and the policies and practices and how they impact students. Um, a point of, of emphasis is that uh, often institutions with the most resources enroll students from enroll the least students from underrepresented backgrounds, and there is a higher concentration of these students in, in institutions that are under resourced. Um, but this slide overall shows that there is a need in the U.S. to serve college students better, especially students of color. So this slide shows the uh, average uh, college completion um, rate. Um, and as you can see, even in looking at the total, which is only at 60%, there's room for, for improvement. Um, but when we look at it, the data disaggregated by race and ethnicity, we see that there continues to be trends um, in, um, in underachievement for underserved students, so the Black, Black students, Hispanic students, Pacific um, uh, Islander students. So if we do this work, there's opportunity to impact everybody, uh, but specifically, you know, focusing on the students who have uh, traditionally been underserved is critically important. Next slide, please.
So reprioritization, I argue that it begins at the highest office and it's crucial for institutions to make clear that their goals and objectives for making, for making inclusive spaces. And I believe that part of this um, has a lot to do with how institutions signal to students that they're there to serve them. I think it's critically important to have a diversity mission and vision statement um, within the organization that um, says specifically, what do we mean when we talk about diversity and inclusion, why it's important to the institutional mission, um, and how will we know if we accomplish that. Um, and that's really important because it really guides how um, how the rest of the or the organization or, or the institution um, embraces embraces uh, the value of diversity. Next slide, please. So as such, in my capstone project, um, I will be creating a five-year enrollment plan that increases, that focuses on increasing diversity in, in the student body that sustains revenue and that also um, improves graduation rates. Um, I believe that um, this process needs to uh, focus on repudiating, repudiating the impact of systemic racism instead of creating microcosms of societal inequities. And in order to do that successfully, we need to be mindful of the sociological processes that impact student development and mediate the broad differences in the ability for students to participate in post-secondary education. And again, that doesn't just mean getting students in through the doors, but it also means how do we ensure that um, these spaces are a welcoming space for students who have traditionally been underserved. Next slide, please. So this, this uh, slide has a lot of information, but these are the various admissions philosophies that I will be focusing on in my um, admissions policy um, theory in, in practice for my case study for my capstone project and they evaluate um, the criteria the criteria de-emphasizes um, the need to focus on standardized testing and prioritize criteria that shows students ability to overcome challenges evidence of leadership and consideration of non-academic factors which is a growing trend um, in admissions policy um, to evaluate character personal qualities that indicate uh, perseverance, and each element's weight is di distributed is dis designed to level out the playing field for low income um, and so low income socioeconomic status students at an academic advantage in traditional application um, review model. So. Um, one of the things that I wanted to quickly point out is that. Um, a study shows a study from 2012 shows that non cognitive attributes on college success uh, on college success reported that this college personal potential index, which is similar to um, a standardized test, but it's more it's not focused on academics and it's focused on a different way to, uh, to measure a students um, academic potential um, that it uh, was significantly statistically significant, showing that um, it can serve as a replacement for a standardized letter of recommendation, which is really important because in underserved high schools, um, not all students have access to great college advising or had the opportunity to build strong relationships with their college advisors who are able to uh, provide uh, really strong letters of recommendation, which is something that um, admissions review counselors really you know, look to for a promise of success. Next slide, please. So this is one of the things that I, I propose is that um, that there needs to be a two review method at, at the minimum and that the counselors need to have some familiarity with the applicant's context of opportunity. Another study showed that when a counselor is familiar, an application reader counselor is familiar with the context of a student's opportunity, a student uh, specifically from underserved backgrounds have a higher chance of being ad admitting to a college or university. Um, the other thing is that test scores uh, can be used um, and play a very important role as a diagnostic tool for placement in admissions, but not as a determination whether a student will get into a college or not. Um, and one of the one of the things that that I really hope to focus on is that uh, to change the way that we uh, that we uh, measure whether a student will be successful in college. I think this process focuses a lot on students who stand to 
who um, like how they have performed in their high school, but sometimes those opportunities that have been available to high school or their high school preparation has been has not been um, you know as rich or robust as students who um, have had other opportunities. Next slide, please. So these are some of the practices that I will be exploring um, in my admissions uh, and retention plan, um, but it focuses on building cohort-based courses for first-year students, focusing on creating um, a community within the institutions, uh, focusing on creating intentional spaces where students can develop and affirm their own college-going identities. Um, and also, I think it's critically important to have a student retention task force that is constantly constantly evaluating how students are trending in our institutions. Um, and it's not just like, you know, one specific uh, office that, that is solely focused on that, but is continuing to share information about how students are performing in the institution within um, other student uh, service offices and direct support roles, and especially faculty as well. Next slide, please. And so this process requires us to challenge the assumptions um, of the policies that are currently in place and analyze what, it, what does the data say, who is benefiting uh, from these practices and who is being excluded. And I think it's important because when we do this work intentionally, everyone can benefit from this process. And that is all I have. Um, I look forward to answering any questions. Um, if you have any, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Maria. We appreciate all the hard work you're doing regarding um, college admissions and particularly college success for our students from marginalized communities. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Maritza Sanchez. She's an American fellow. Her discipline, <coughs> excuse me, is mechanical engineering. She has a PhD for material science and engineering. She's at UC San Diego and her topic is the development of cubic morphology of perovskite materials for enhanced creep resistance. And she's sponsored by the Redlands branch, by my own San Diego branch, yay, and from Delmar Lucadia, 50th anniversary for all. Thank you so much, Maritza. Thank you so much for the introduction, Lynn. Um, and thank you to all the sponsors who allowed me to be sponsored to continue my PhD work um, at UC San Diego. Uh, it's really great to be a part of such an amazing organization. Um, so don't, please do not let the title intimidate you at all. Um, I'll try to break this down as much as I can. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, I like to think that I am playing Tetris um, in my PhD work. Um, and I think it's a really good connection between um, the very theoretical difficult subjects and kind of the overall of what, what I'm doing within um, my chair the materials research. Um, and so if you think about Tetris and playing Tetris, you take um, pretty much these cubes, these blocks or cubes, um, and kind of just assemble them into different things by stacking them on top of each other or side to side. And so that's pretty much exactly what I'm doing. Um, but I am looking at things that are very, very tiny. Um, and so I look at particles of different types of materials. In my case, I look at ceramic materials, which pretty much just means are materials that can operate at really high temperatures. Um, so it, they're used for very specific applications that might be using operating temperatures of you know, 2000 degrees Celsius or something like that. Um, and so what I'm doing is I'm looking at the very tiny particles that are about nanometers um, in size so significantly thinner than your strand of hair. Um, and then kind of using the idea of Tetris to assemble these particles into very specific structures. And when I do that, I'm able to just control the behavior of the material when we look at it at a larger scale. Um, and so it's kind of just building um, and connecting these four different areas, which is the material structure, um, the properties and or performance on how the material behaves at the larger scale. So thinking about making materials that are better, uh, more potent, um, can withstand like more harsh uh, environments, um, things like that. So when you do that, you're able to do um, and make things like faster planes, um, planes that can go into or uh, rockets that can go into space and withstand different types of environments. Um, so overall, just better uh, and more efficient uh, machines. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, and so overall, my project kind of just uses this four step process in which I start playing Tetris. Uh, so I make these cubes um, using uh, chemistry methods and then um, start to assemble these cubes into these very specific ordered arrangements. So side to side. And you can think about, um, you know, trying to kind of put together uh, blocks or cubes um, compared to balls. So if you have like balls that you're trying to set up next to each other, there's a lot of instability there. There's a lot of open space between the balls because they don't fit so compactly together. Whereas if you have blocks, then you can um, reduce that space that you have in between and fit them a lot closer together because of these very clear uh, faces on the blocks. Um, and so that's kind of the idea here as well. Once I do that, um, I can then uh, prepare these materials by uh, exposing them to these very high temperatures to kind of bring them together, make sure that all of these particles are kind of touching and reducing that overall space between them. Um, because when I do reduce that overall space, I can enhance the overall behavior at the larger scale. And in terms of creep resistance, what we're really talking about here is just the application of these materials. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, please. So um, for creep, um, what creep kind of means is just um, exposed, um, exposed environments that can cause a material to either break um, or fracture or not perform as well. And so if you think about it over time, if you are applying a very high load onto maybe just a piece of wood um, over time, there's gonna be some deformation that happens to that piece of wood because of the weight that's being applied to it. And so very thing, things that are very similar happen with uh, all these different types of materials, whether it be you know, load or weight that's applied, um, whether it's temperatures, very high temperatures that are applied over a long period of time, um, radiation or different types of energy that these materials are exposed to over a really long time. And so pretty much is trying to make these materials um, be able to be, withstand all of these environments over a longer period of time um, by using different chemistry methods, um, different structure, oh, sorry, structures um, in terms of the particles um, to kind of change the behavior overall. Um, and if we go to the next slide, please. Yeah, and so why is this important? Um, so there's a lot of problems in the world right now that we're trying to solve in terms of energy, um, in terms of technology and things like this. And so materials, make up everything in the world. Um, and so the better materials that we have, the more um, we are to able to solve these problems. So if we can enhance the materials that we use in terms of these applications, we can um, push forward towards, you know, making more uh, clean energy um, options. Also like making, like I said, faster planes, um, um, enhanced technology that we use, so faster computers, smaller computers, smaller phones, all of these kinds of stuff. And so it's really important um, to study the materials to make them more efficient to kind of solve some of these big world problems. Um, next slide, please. And so at the end, I kind of just wanted to give a little introduction about myself. Um, I had a very non-traditional journey through this um, being, I think, a lot of um, the other fellows and grantees here have talked about, you know, being a minority or these underrepresented groups. And I fall into one of those categories. I fall into being a double minority because I am Latina, I am a woman, and I'm in the STEM fields. Um, so it has been a little bit of a journey for me. I did not, um, I kind of really like applaud the work that's being done um, by Jody because as a high school student, I was not exposed to STEM. Um, it's not a common field within my family. Um, and so for me, everything was really new. So I started off at UC Santa Barbara actually as a non-engineering major because I didn't know that engineering was an option for me to do. Um, and so thanks to a really great math teacher, um, I was able to explore the field and then make the decision to kind of transfer into that. And that led me to transferring into Cal State Los Angeles where I did pursue my mechanical engineering degree. And now I have been in school for 10 years, um, still in the engineering field. Um, and I continue to do that. So, and I also learned from my experience and have really tried to give back to those communities. Um, so I do a lot of outreach, um, specifically STEM outreach for underrepresented students, as well as women. Um, and so I have been a part of the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, very heavily involved. Um, and then the subchapter, which is Shiptinas, which is focusing on Latinas in the STEM fields. 
And so through this role, I've been able to do a lot of different things, mentor people, put on workshops that really talk about the things that women, being a double minority in the STEM fields, women like myself face, um, and really feeling like you belong in this field overall. Um, and also bringing together this group, building that community that you know, I didn't see grow, like going through my college years, I was probably one of the only Hispanic girls in my classes. And so really trying to build a community so that future generations don't feel so lonely or so isolated and they have that community to talk to. Um, and I'm a proud daughter of two immigrant parents from Mexico. So they have been my driving force, my motivation through continuing education and doing all these things. Um, and so I'm really grateful to them and just kind of wanted to share a little bit about them as well. Um, but yeah, that is a little bit about myself. Um, thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for sharing with us about your journey. And also thank you for explaining your work and showing how it does affect all of us. I'd now like to introduce to you Kelly Subramanian. She's an American fellow. Her discipline is biology. She is at the University of California, Davis. She's doing postdoctoral cell biology and biology education. Uh, and her topic is spatial organization of metabolic complexes and instructor talk in laboratory courses. She's sponsored by the Northern District, Jane, <coughs> excuse me, Jane Baker and Florence Rhodes and the Martinez Branch 50th anniversary. Kelly. Um, okay. So thank you so much, um, Lynn, for that introduction. Um, and I'd, of course, like to first thank AAUW for your support this year during my postdoc. Um, it really has allowed me to focus on my research and, and work closely with undergraduate researchers at UC Davis. And just like I think a common thread of all the fellows here today, um, that I'm very much committed to mentoring undergraduate researchers who are from really diverse backgrounds, really hoping to build a stronger scientific community. Um, and so today I'm really happy to talk a bit about these two questions I'm interested in. So one's related to mitochondrial biology and the second is related to effective lab instruction. Um, and so I'm interested in mitochondrial biology. And so here's just a picture of a eukaryotic cell that many of you um, probably have seen in one of your biology courses. Um, and it's very much an image that I saw when I was taking courses um, in my undergraduate career. And I'd like to, you to just take a moment and think, where are the mitochondria and can you identify them in this um, image? And so perhaps um, maybe you guessed right away, mitochondria are these kind of jelly bean like, um, jelly bean shaped organelles that are shown in red. Um, and so now I wanna show you kind of an image from a review paper. Um, so next, yes, thank you. Um, and this really shows how crowded a eukaryotic cell really is. And I'd like to really ask you that same question. Can you identify where the mitochondria are in this image? And so I suspect um, after this small moment that many of you maybe hesitated. Um, and I really did too before I learned um, more about mitochondrial biology. Uh, and so mitochondria actually in this image are these purple kind of tubular organelles. Um, and they're, you know, they're not really circular in this image. Um, and their structure and shape are really essential for their function. Um, and so this is actually what uh, a mitochondria look like in, in a uh, mammalian cell or some mammalian cells where mitochondria here in this image are shown in red. And within this really beautiful organelle, um, excuse me, uh, there are these really specialized regions. And here on this image, it's termed COQ domains in green. And they're really important for producing this, um, a redox lipid that's required in this process of making energy for the cell. Because maybe you've heard too, the kind of iconic um, terminology of mitochondria are this powerhouse of the cell. And so while I'm really showing you just one example of a specialized domain um, that we've characterized in mitochondria, mitochondria actually have a lot of regions that form these microenvironments that are required for not only the function of mitochondria, but also the function of a, of a cell. And so here I'm showing you um, a budding yeast cell. So this is actually the, the same yeast that is in the bread you eat, um, but these are model organisms that we can study in the lab uh, and they also have really um, similar pathways, proteins, and, and similar behavior uh, to what's going on in cells in our own body. Um, and so here in this image, it's just another example of a specialized domain uh, 
uh, that's labeled in yellow. And that's actually where mitochondrial DNA is found. And th that mitochondrial DNA, that specialized region is really important uh, for the health of mitochondria. Um, and so mitochondria uh, serve as these really metabolic parts of eukaryotic cells because they're really housing a lot of these metabolic processes. Um, and so we know a lot of, of these complicated metabolic pathways, and that's actually shown in the background of this slide, um, and that these are really uh, complex uh, metabolic pathways going on in our bodies. But, but we really don't fully understand how these processes are spatially organized within cells, um, but we really think that's important for their function. So one of the really big questions I have and am interested in is how these metabolic complexes are organized within cells. Um, and so here I'm just showing you a few examples of these complexes in budding yeast. Um, and all of these complexes shown here seem to localize to domains in cells. And to really start to understand this kind of spatial organization question, I work really closely with a lot of undergrad researchers um, to essentially just make a map to really determine how these complexes are positioned relative to one another, and also to understand their kind of relationship with each other. And so that was one really big question I'm interested in lab, but I'm also really interested in understanding kind of features of research-based lab instruction that impact students' development. And so these are called CURES, uh, course-based undergraduate research experiences, and they're really advocated as an approach to broaden access to research for all students and have um, been shown to potentially influence student retention in college and persistence in STEM. Um, so while research has shown some of these features, um, excuse me, so they've shown that some of these features that are important for cures um, that I've listed here, so such as um, engaging in iterative work, providing opportunities to make discoveries, and also developing kind of greater ownership of scientific projects, um, these are just a few of the features. However, they really don't explain all of these cure-linked increase in students' commitment to continuing science. And so to begin to understand this, I'm collaborating researchers led by Aaron Dolan at University of Georgia and Jeff Olimpo at the University of Texas, El Paso. And we're all um, wondering, asking whether what instructors say to students impact student outcomes in lab courses. So we're using these frameworks from mentorship and classroom discourse that have been shown um, in the field, and we're using those frameworks to identify and compare what instructors say to students in life science lab courses. So what we're doing is we're currently actually um, collecting data from students in these lab courses on their scientific self-efficacy and also um, um, scientific identity, and then hopefully relating them back to these dimensions of instructor talk that we're characterizing um, to the student scientific integration. So really, ultimately, we're, we're hoping that our work will reveal new insights into factors that are influencing these cure effectiveness for students and really to help identify what do instructors and say that can improve lab instruction. Um, and so actually with that, um, I'd like to again thank uh, AAUW for your support and all the sponsors that have um, sponsoring me for this fellowship this year, as well as all the undergraduate researchers I've been super fortunate to collaborate with over the years. So thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate all the work you're doing, not only on the mitochondrial and the research itself and the effects of uh, teacher talk on lab courses. That's so important. And we thank you for your efforts on focusing on mentoring as well. So all of these fantastic women are here with us today because of the AAUW Fund. And in addition to simply making donations for which we are eternally grateful, we do have a couple of other ways that you can support this program. So we have two speakers now who are gonna to talk to you a little bit about these additional ways. Judy Haran is gonna to talk to you about the Legacy Circle. Judy, please do. Okay, I think I'm unmuted, am I right? Yes, Judy. Oh, okay. yeah. Hi, I hope you can see me. I don't know whether I'm on here or not, but anyway, I'll talk to you. I'm so glad to be here today. I'm proud and 
very pleased to represent the Legacy Circle today and knowing that um, there are many of you who are on this, uh, oh, wait a minute. Okay. Anyway, uh, the Legacy Circle is a big part of AUW. Um, I have been a member since it first started because my personal motto has always been live, love, and leave a legacy. So leaving a legacy for me was always important. And I love working for the Legacy Circle. Um, California is one of uh, nine areas where we have liaisons and we're so big and wonderful. Of course, we have two people and Charmin Gehring is in the North and I'm in the South. And obviously, if you've never heard of the Legacy Circle, it is AUW's planned giving uh, arm that we use. And we're very, well represented by Katrina today and also Heather Miller who runs everything for our little group. So we're very happy about that. The thing I wanna tell you is that it's so simple to do something for AUW. Most of you have been members for a long time. You have given over the years and what better, better gift to see things go on like to keep funding these types of programs that we have. And there's all kinds of ways for you to do this. It's a one page form that you fill out. You don't have to tell anybody how much, it's very private. Um, you can do definitely a will, a trust, an insurance policy, a retirement account, um, all kinds of things. And uh, Charmin and I are very glad to help you with that. And uh, Heather Miller in Washington, as I say, is our uh, guru. So she knows the things that we don't know, but we're just, Really, really happy of that. And I wanna thank all the members who are on this call today who are Legacy Circle members and hope that you will keep helping us uh, build up our numbers. And of course, California always wants to be first. So we have our own little competitions going on within our group. So uh, thanks to Sharman who's done a great job this year. And a shout out to Sharon Westerfer from Long Beach who has really added to our list. So anytime you wanna know anything about us, we're on the website, we're in the California directory and um, please, we, we do the North and South, but we, we don't care. We don't really have boundaries. So if you wanna contact me, that's fine or Charmin, either one. So thank you for listening today. And I can't think of a, a, a more difficult act to follow after all these wonderful fellows. So thanks to all the fellows today. Thank you, Diane and Lynn. Thank you so much, Judy. And you know what? Part of our five-star status that we would like to achieve is to increase our membership in the Golden Legacy Circle 10% statewide. So please help us to achieve that goal. And you also obviously will be supporting these wonderful women. And another opportunity for giving, which I believe is unique to California, is going to be explained to you by Sharon Schuster, who's a former AW state president. Sharon. Thank you, Lynn. It's my pleasure to be with you today uh, to tell you about uh, a different way that you can make a commitment to AUW. You've heard about a variety of ways today. You can choose to support the fine work of our fellows and grant awardees uh, weren't they wonderful to hear from in the work that they're doing? And you can make a legacy gift, as Judy told you, that will aid AUW far into the future. And you're probably aware of uh, the Greatest Needs Fund that uh, is used to, today to support the current program. But I want to let you know about another alternative, and that's the Menin Lecce Giving Circle. 20 years ago, some of us came together as a giving circle to support projects within AUW, and we agreed to donate current funds and to choose a program or project to fund. We've funded research such as Barriers and Bias, Deeper in Debt, 
crossing the line. And these are just a few that I pulled off my shelf. We've funded community action grants in California because most of our members live in California. And we wanted to fund beyond what the endowed funds would have permitted. We're currently considering funding additional work on the Latina initiative, or maybe more grants, or maybe increasing the level of get out the vote involvement. Now, anyone can give to the giving circle. All you need to do is to note fund number 4229 with your donation. But if you want to be part of the decision making about what projects we will choose, we ask for a commitment. And this commitment is to, first of all, to give annually every year at a significant level. Now, what do I mean by significant? Well, we start at the chocolate club level. That's $300. And you, if you haven't been giving at that level, we ask for 500 for the first year, going up to 1,000 in two years. And we also ask that you consider increasing your gift by 10% a year to overcome the impact of inflation. With your significant gift, you can join us in saluting Manin Lecce, our role model in giving, and in making a difference in AUW. So to find out more about it, I suggest that you contact me at Sharon at Schuster.org or my phone number, 818-888-1376, and we can talk about what's possible for you to be part of the Manin Lecce Giving Circle. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a wonderful event. I'm sure that all of you are just over the moon as I am about these fantastic exemplary women that we've seen today. And today's success, of course, is the culmination of work by many people. It's my privilege to chair the fund committee and the members of that committee are Judy Horan, Liz Bathgate, Sharman Gehring, Raleigh Windorf, Sharon Westifer, Pamela Meyer, Aria Tower, the current state gift named honoree, Jan Crook, and although Diane Owen is listed as an ex officio, because she was a former chair of the fund committee, we relied so heavily on her expertise and her connections. We owe a huge debt of gratitude as well to our behind the scene experts, Sandy Gabe, who's our guru of Zoom. And not only has she done these events, but she does the practice events as well. Tracy Clark, who did the internet postings, other members of the communication committee who stepped in whenever needed. Pamela Meyer, who is our new scheduler, and she contacted all 38 of the women, scheduled their appearances at the events and the practices, obtained their information in order to schedule them for branch or IBC visits, and actually has already scheduled three. Also, Tremaine Parquet, he's the Deputy Director of Advancement for AAUW, he was instrumental in getting us timely information. Also in today's, um, I was gonna call it a webinar, today's event, Gail Swain and um, who's with her? Oh, Randa Blanding. Those two are monitoring the chat and the question and answer. And we appreciate that too. Of course, you know, our main gra gratitude is out to our grant recipients and our fellows who obviously have very busy lives and lots of studying to do, and we appreciate them so much for being with you today. And a big thank you, of course, to our other presenters, Katrina Sunbreeze, AAUW Senior Director of Advancement, Judy Horan for the Legacy Circle, Sharon Schuster, 
And uh, <clears throat> all, there are always bold, brave, and brilliant. Diana wins. Of course, we are so grateful to our sponsors and our donors, and for all of you who are here with us today. I have five just really quick reminders. Number one, the fund's deadline is the end of December, so you still have time for that final push for contributions. And you remember that the, because of the five-star initiative, that's the reason I chose 555,000. So anything you can do to get us to that, we would love it. Number two, the deadline for branch named gift honorees is March 1st. So you can submit one name for each $750 that your branch contributes to the AAUW fund. Number three, the deadline for the state named gift honoree applications is February 15th. So every branch can submit a name of which honors a member who's done outstanding work to promote the programs and the goals of AAUW fund and or of AAUW California. And five, you may still register for our other two events, which are next Saturday, October the 30th, and the, which is also from 10 to 12, and the following Sunday, November 7th, from 1 to 3. And that'll give you the chance to see our other 25 outstanding fellows and grant recipients. And lastly, photos and brief biographies of all of our fellows and grant recipients and all of the forms you need are on the located on our AEW California website. Just click at the top where it says funds. And that's also the place you'll find the application in order to request a grant recipient at your branch or IBC. Thank you again for coming and have a great rest of your day. Because we had so many wonderful women to speak to us, we weren't able to get to the Q&A or the chat. If you have a pressing question, we will certainly get back to you. Or if you've thought of something that you'd like to know, please send the information to me and I will find the answer for you. Thank you again for coming. Bye.